Um, I've spoken to you earlier about the most common type of hemorrhagic stroke, which was intracerebral hemorrhage. Now we're going to switch to something perhaps a bit rarer and talk about a specific type of subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is called cortical subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now we as neurologists um, have a bit of a tendency of disengaging us from patient care when we hear the term subarachnoid hem hemorrhage and leaving it up to our neurosurgical co colleagues to take care of uh, this patient group. But I would like to make uh, the argument uh, that in this particular type of subarachnoid hemorrhage, we are mostly dealing with cerebrovascular conditions that we as neurologists are probably quite familiar with. So what I wanted to do in this uh, presentation is sort of make a differentiation between an aneurysmal and non-aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, review some of the epidemiology of cortical subarachnoid hemorrhage, look at the manner of presentation, look a little bit at etiologies and workup in particular, and then perhaps um, um, cover some of the treatment. Now when it comes to differentiating subarachnoid hemorrhage in terms of different types, it's all about location of the blood. In aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, so subarachnoid hemorrhage that's being generated from an aneurysm uh, that leaked and ruptured, we're talking about blood that's at the base of the brain, in the cisterns at the base of the brain, just around the circle of villus. Then there's a uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage that's uh, a peculiar type that's mostly around the midbrain that's called perimesencephalic subarachnoid hemorrhage where we usually do not find an aneurysm. And then we have subarachnoid hemorrhage that occurs over the convexities on the outside on top of the brain, mostly in the frontal areas that call it either convexity or cortical subarachnoid hemorrhage, which is also not associated with an aneurysm. Now here are some examples of aneurysmal subarachnoid hemorrhage, so subarachnoid hemorrhage that's related to an aneurysm, usually at the circular villus at the base of the brain. And remember that uh, we're looking at blood now in the subarachnoid spaces outside the brain. Blood is white here. And you can see that from the distribution of the blood, you can often make an inference as to where the aneurysm might be. And these are all aneurysmal patterns of blood distribution in the subarachnoid space. So here you see one where there's uh, quite a bit of blood anteriorly, maybe a bit more in the left sylvian fissure. This was a left middle cerebral artery aneurysm that ruptured. Here we have blood that's sort of posteriorly located. This was a PCOM aneurysm. And here again, blood that's mostly anteriorly located in the intercerebral uh, uh, fissure. And that was an anterior communicating artery aneurysm. Um, so these uh, patterns of blood distribution associated with aneurysms, there's a high rate of re-bleeding. We have to do a cerebral angiogram early to detect the aneurysm, to coil it, to clip it, depending on what the optimal treatment might be. If we don't see an aneurysm with this type of uh, blood distribution on the first angiogram, then there's a recommendation to repeat the angiogram a few days later to make sure that you didn't miss a thrombosed aneurysm in the acute setting. And these patients also have a high risk of going to subsequent vasospasm between days 4 and 14, which then can lead to ischemic strokes. Now, these are examples of perimesencephalic uh, subarachnoid hemorrhages. So the blood is much more localized right around the midbrain, typically not associated with um, an aneurysm. Here, there's some controversy as to what an extent you should look for an aneurysm. Some uh, authorities recommend that you might not even need a catheter angiogram. You could get away with a CT angiogram or an MRA perhaps looking, at the, uh, looking for the aneurysm, um, which you usually won't find anyway. Um, our practice is typically to perform an angiogram, a catheter angiogram in these cases, and to perhaps a follow-up non-invasive vascular image down the road. And then we are dealing with the cortical and covexity subarachnoid hemorrhages, which I will be focusing for the most part on. And these are very subtle. So there's just a little bit of blood. You can see it sometimes just in one sulcus. Here it's very faint. Um, typically in the frontal lobe, sometimes you may see them more posteriorly. You can see that the bleeding amount is a lot less here. And these are typically patterns of subarachnoid hemorrhage that are not associated with an aneurysm. <coughs> You often see them better on MRI imaging, and particularly flare. You can detect the intrasulcal blood quite nicely. Here it might be, you can see it reasonably well, um, but you probably appreciate it a bit better on this side. <laughs> 
Now symptoms, uh, anytime you're dealing with subarachnoid bleeding, hemorrhage, uh, a headache uh, is a frequent uh, complication. They're typically not the bad thunderclap type of headaches, which are described as the word headaches of somebody's life. Somebody's life. Uh, probably because there's less blood, um, you get less uh, nuclear rigidity, less uh, photophobia, and less nausea and vomiting as well, because you don't get as much into ICP issues from a lot of blood. And then you run into uh, focal neurological uh, symptoms a lot as well, sort of heaviness over the heavy body, numbness over the heavy body. And these are very often transient in a spreading type of manner over several minutes and then resolve and then come back again. And more rarely, they may be more persistent. So one uh, interesting uh, question is, what is the mechanism of these transient symptoms with blood that's actually on the outside? of the brain. There's some question whether these are perhaps small seizures, but they may also be a form of spreading depression. And what spreading depression is that there's sort of a automatic discharge of the brain tissue. It depolarizes it and you get a transient neurological event. It remains depolarized and then uh, symptoms gradually recover. Um, this is a case uh, that exemplifies this. This was uh, reported by some of my colleagues. Um, and is or in regards to a, a, a patient who had a subdural hematoma with left convexity and did not have it drained because it wasn't severe enough and then had episodes of aphasia that lasted for 30, 40 minutes. And they were able to study this patient uh, quite uh, well during these episodes. So here you see the subdural with uh, blood sort of along the, uh, along the uh, convexities, perhaps a little bit of subarachnoid blood as well. They were able to do a perfusion CT study during one of these episodes. And you can see that the cerebral blood volume, which is an indication for ischemia was pretty symmetric on both sides. There was perhaps a little bit of hyperperfusion looking at cerebral blood flow and the mean transit time, but not enough to suggest ischemia. They were able to do an EEG during that episode as well, and there was no seizure activity. And the patient had been treated with Keppra and then was switched over to uh, Topamax, which has more than an effect on spreading depression and were able to sort of abort these episodes. And what this suggests is that blood sort of on the outset of the brain acts as an irritant, triggers the spreading waves of depolarization, which then causes transient neurological symptoms that um, we also see in cortical subarachnoid hemorrhage, perhaps to a lesser extent because the blood is less. So it's not you know, the most uh, frequent uh, form of, uh, of subarachnoid hemorrhage. And if you look at the epidemiology, the prevalence rates are generally very low. We sort of restricted to small case series to learn about this condition. This was a study by Kumar of Beth Israel in Boston. They looked over a five year period, had 460 patients with subarachnoid hemorrhage, and you can see that only a minority of them really had a cortical distribution of the subarachnoid hemorrhage. Similarly, a more recent study out of Japan, again, almost 5,000 patients over a six year period, and again, a very low percentage who actually had a cortical subarachnoid hemorrhage. But I think if you are a reasonably high volume stroke center like you are over here, you're going to see these patients with a regularity throughout the year. Now, what do we know about etiology? I'm not gonna talk much about trauma because trauma is you know, often apparent in the setting of a cortical subarachnoid hemorrhage. And I'm going to focus primarily in the top three conditions here which probably compromise most of the etiologies in this condition. So we're gonna talk about some amyloid angiopathy, reversible cerebral vasoconstriction syndrome, and then the role of extracranial large vessel disease in generating a cortical subarachnoid hemorrhage. And then just for completeness sake, I'll touch upon a few of these other conditions that we should keep in mind and um, that are very rare causes of a convexity subarachnoid hemorrhage. Now, if you've heard me speak a bit about amyloid angiopathy earlier in my talk on intracerebral hemorrhage, where we are most familiar with um, amyloid angiopathy giving rise to recurrent cortical hemorrhages, and that's sort of the classical presentation. These hemorrhages I've shown you were typically posteriorly, temporally, occipitally located, but there are other manifestations of amyloid angiopathy as well. Often it can give rise to sort of TIA migratory component that gets uh, mimic, that's sort of felt to be a mimic of a seizure, 
but it's probably not. Then there is this cognitive impairment and dementia. We see the isolated cortical subarachnoid hemorrhage, which are relevant in this context. And then there's a very, very condition where the blood deposits actually give rise to inflammation, and you get an amyloid inflammation that gets treated with, with uh, immunosuppression. So I've mentioned, uh, I've shown this previously to you in amyloid angiopathy, you get the position of the amyloid protein in the arteries over the convexities. And instead of bleeding and breaking and bleeding into the brain parenchyma, in a cortical convexity subarachnoid hemorrhage, the bleeding is just into the subarachnoid space. And I'm not going to go into this. I've shown you this before. And um, this is sort of an example of somebody who had this. Uh, this was a gentleman who was elderly, as typical patients with amyloid angiopathy are, developed sudden confusion, had two episodes of right-sided face, arm and leg heaviness and tingling that sort of spread down. They lasted several minutes and recovered, and then continued actually with several of these episodes after he was admitted. This was his CT on admission, and you see just a little bit of focal sulcal blood over here. We see it better again on MRI scanning, and then I had mentioned to you the importance of gradient echo imaging in detecting some of these microbleeds in my previous talk. And this is an example of that where you see the gradient echo images, darkest blood, you see multiple other microbleeds suggestive of amyloid angiopathy. And the other thing you see here, you see hemosiderin deposits outlying the sulci, which is known as superficial siderosis, which is also a component of amyloid angiopathy. So this patient probably had recurrent sub arachnoid bleeds, some of which were likely clinically silent, leading to these hemosiderin deposits. This time it came in with perhaps a bit of a larger bleed. These transient symptoms that we tried to treat with antiepileptics didn't respond to and then ultimately attribute them to these sort of spreading depression waves. Um, now let me uh, switch over to reversible cerebral vasoconstrictive syndrome, which is a disease that we are now understanding more and more. It, become, it has really uh, reached the horizon over the last uh, s 10 years or so. It's a condition where these cerebral arteries, for reasons that are not quite clear to us, undergo sudden vasoconstriction, um, which then over the next several weeks sort of reverses and normalizes. The triggers for this are unknown. We think that uh, serotonin uptake inhibitors, some form of chemotherapies might trigger this. Certainly some vasoactive drugs such as cocaine or amphetamines may trigger it as well. And patients present with a variable different kinds of symptoms. Often it's a thunderclap-like headache that is recurrent, so headaches that are uh, sort of uh, that, that beat you up day after day for several days or even weeks. Um, often with focal uh, neurological uh, symptoms, and they can present with variable stroke syndrome. So either ischemic strokes, they can present with parenchymal hemorrhages or subarachnoid hemorrhages, and this part, this uh, setting particularly with cortical subarachnoid hemorrhages. And uh, the way they then get diagnosed is by demonstrating the vasoconstriction, which then on follow-up imaging sort of uh, goes away. So this is a typical example. This was a young woman develops thunderclap headaches, which are recurrent, persistent over seven to 10 days, um, ultimately has a worse hemorrhage, comes to us, gets diagnosed with a cortical subarachnoid hemorrhage, has a cerebral angiogram that actually shows the areas of vasoconstriction. We treat her with uh, calcium channel blockers, which we think vasodilate. We usually use verapamil or nimodipine, and then on a follow-up angiogram a month and a half later, everything is normalized. These are her imaging findings. Here you see the CAT scan on admission, which shows the subtle convexity subarachnoid hemorrhage. Here you see the angiogram, and you see segmental areas of vasoconstriction, which then all sort of go away later on. We did treat her with verapamil. At the same time, we also do quite a bit of transcranial Dopplers in our practice. We were able to study this patient with transcranial Doppler. You see the increase in flow velocity here, which systolic 
flow velocities more uh, above 200, and just a few days later, the flow velocities start to drop. We were actually able to study a number of patients with transcranial Doppler who had reversible vasoconstrictive syndrome, and we see this interesting crescendo, decrescendo pattern of flow velocities, and this is how we like to follow our patients. I think it gives us um, a way of seeing once the patient starts improving, it's a nice way of feedback for the patient as well. So if you have the ability to do transcranial Dopplers in this particular condition, we think it really helps in monitoring the patients. And the other thing that's of interest is that a number of patients with reversible vasoconstrictive syndrome will have a normal vascular stud in the beginning, and you start picking up the vasculopathy only a few days after they presented to you, so several, maybe into the second week of their symptom. And the feeling is that this condition starts distally in the small vessels and moves proximally to the larger vessels at the base of the brain. Now, in the past, um, a lot of these patients were diagnosed as a primary CNS vasculitis. And the feeling now is that a lot of these patients that were presumed to be this really had a reversible vasoconstrictive syndrome. They would get treated with a course of steroids, you know, for several weeks, and then a follow-up image was done, which was normal, and then that was sort of taken as further proof that this was an immune vasculitic type of disorder, but these patients were probably getting just better on their own. Now, one uh, easy way to um, classify uh, uh, these, these patients is uh, something that was suggested by uh, these authors, is to divide the patients into age less of 60 and age uh, greater than 60 who have a, a corticosubarachnoid hemorrhage. And the age group that was less than 60, by far the most common etiology was reversible vasoconstrictive syndrome with about 60%. And if you are older than 60, then you were two-thirds of the patients uh, had amyloid angiopathy at the cause of their uh, cortical subarachnoid hemorrhage. And correspondingly, patients presented a little bit differently. Younger patients tended to present with a thunderclap headache, and older patients presented more likely with these transient sensory and motor symptoms. So this is a nice way of sort of approaching your patient when they first come to you with a cortical subarachnoid hemorrhage. Um, these are the most frequent etiologies from the two largest case studies that we're able to find. So these patients, this case study had 29 patients, about evenly divided between uh, amyloid and um, reversible vasoconstrictive syndrome. And then these patients over here in that case series also uh, had a fair amount of patients with amyloid angiopathy. Now, I wanted to draw attention to the fact that you can have extracranial processes that can lead to this condition as well. So all of the pathology in cortical subarachnoid hemorrhage is really inside the brain. That's where we see the hemorrhages. But um, the vascular pathology may actually be on the outside. So this was a young woman who actually uh, gave birth and then a couple of days later developed sudden onset of headaches and you see bilateral convexity subarachnoid hemorrhages and interestingly she had an extracranial dissection of the carotid artery. So quite removed from where we actually found the hemorrhages. And a similar thing can also happen with arthrosclerotic disease in the neck. So high-grade stenosis in the neck can sometimes present with a convexity subarachnoid hemorrhage. The mechanism is not quite clear. There's some thought to that the pathology in the neck, sort of narrowing stenosis, leads to vasodilation of the arteries over the convexities as a comp compensatory auto-regulatory phenomena. So if stenosis here, the arteries distally vasodilate to maintain blood flow. The vasodilate maximally, perhaps become fragile and leaky. And then you throw a little microembolus on top of that, either from a carotid plaque or, in this case, maybe a microembolus from a dissection, perhaps cause a small little stroke, reperfuse that stroke, and then have a hemorrhage. So those are sort of the, the, the thought processes why extracranial disease might lead to a distal subarachnoid hemorrhage. We can see it occasionally post-stenting of the carotid artery, again lending credence to this concept that if you reperfuse, and reperfusion injury may cause a, a small little leaky distal blood vessel. Now, we've drawn attention to the fact 
that sometimes you can see these convexity subarachnoid hemorrhage in the vicinity nearby very small ischemic stroke lesions that otherwise might not get detected. So here we had a small case series of three patients who presented with convexity subarachnoid hemorrhages. And in each instance, we found small little ischemic lesions close by where we felt that this was sort of uh, a reperfusion of a small cortical infarct with bleeding not into the brain, so not hemorrhagic conversion of an infarct, but sort of hemorrhagic subarachnoid conversion, if you want to think of that as a possible other reason why you might get this presentation. So again, I think we've covered for the most part here really conditions between amyloid, between RCVS, and small strokes, extracranial disease that we as neurologists really take care of for the most part. Um, just to finish up with other potential causes of little uh, convexity subarachnoid hemorrhages, um, you know, anytime you have a distal sub, uh, subarachnoid hemorrhage, you have to worry about aneurysms that might occur more distally, which is typically in endocarditis, so mycotic aneurysms you should think about. I have to admit, I don't think we've ever seen a case that presented with an isolated uh, convexity subarachnoid hemorrhage in the setting of endocarditis. These patients usually have a number of other concomitant lesion, and here you see other infarcts and hemorrhagic infarcts in this particular instance. Um, this is a case of transverse sinus thrombosis, and, they, and sometimes a small cortical vein thrombosis uh, can present with a convexity subarachnoid hemorrhage as well. Here you see parts of a, convex, uh, parts of a uh, sulcal hemorrhage, and here you see a transverse sinus that's pretty hyperdense and was occluded. So the treatment for these patients is obviously quite different as they require likely anticoagulation. A special risk period is always the postpartum period for stroke, and this is also true for uh, the convexity subarachnoid hemorrhages. Um, if we do see a woman who recently gave birth with a convexity subarachnoid hemorrhage, these would be the things that we would be concerned about. So this, there's this postpartum vasculopathy, which used to be called called Fleming's, which probably is just a variant of the reversible vasoconstrictive syndrome, sort of fitting in nicely with what we talked earlier about. The postpartum period is also a prothrombotic state, so cortical vein thrombosis or larger cerebral vein thrombosis is a consideration. And um, sometimes you have to worry about press, where you see the more typical posterior um, leuk encephalopathy type changes on MR imaging. So treatment, um, you know, for amyloid angiopathy, there's not much we can offer our patients. You know, judicious control of blood pressure, careful reevaluation of antithrombotic and anticoagulant uh, regimens, uh, obviously, would be in order. With RCVS, we use calcium channel blockers, cortical vein thrombosis, likely anticoagulation. If you have a dissection with uh, a, a convexity hemorrhage, you may want to hold antithrombotics in the first few days, let things settle down, and then depending on what your preference is, either use antithrombotics or perhaps even anticoagulants. Now, I've come up with sort of a diagnostic algorithm to maybe help us uh, work through this. So we have a patient who has the appropriate syndromes, uh, comes in, has a brain CT scan, gets diagnosed with a convective subarachnoid hemorrhage. I would then proceed with a brain MRI and an MRA, making sure we do a gradient echo image. And this should capture a large, it should capture all of our amyloid angiopathies probably, may capture most of your RCVS, your ischemic lesions, uh, you should pick up some cortical vein thrombosis this way. If this should not be diagnostic, maybe proceed with extracranial imaging, looking for dissection, looking for atherosclerotic disease. And then if that, again, is not diagnostic, consider doing an MR venogram or a CT venogram to so looking at the large veins. And then, again, if that's not diagnostic, consider catheter angiogram, looking perhaps for smaller aneurysms and some rare dural fistulas um, which again would be a bit unusual to present just with that. And then if everything is still unremarkable and if you saw the patient fairly early in the course of the illness, patient continues to have symptoms, particularly with recurrent thunderclap headaches, then consider delayed vascular cerebral imaging to pick up those delayed RCVS cases uh, where the initial studies may be unremarkable. <laughs> 
Um, so again, you know, I hope to have convinced you that you know, cortical subarachnoid hemorrhage is a, a disease um, of many etiologies, most of which we uh, as neurologists should be quite comfortable sort of as, as, as treating. Thank you. <laughs>